financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vonning. You're listening to the Vonning Podcast. And welcome to the Vonu Podcast. I'm Shane and... I'm Kyle. Certainly glad you've decided to join us today. The Vonu Podcast is now covered by a Bipcot no government license. Reuse and modification is permitted to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at bipcot.org. The title of this episode is Anarchic Vonu Part 2 and the show notes can be found at vonupodcast.com forward slash three. Again, the website is vonnypodcast.com, and there's a lot of valuable material on there already. Obviously, Rayo's book, Vonny, the Search for Personal Freedom, is available for free download, but there's other stuff as well. Uh, for example, there's an FAQ with what we believe to be the most common questions that could arise when someone is first introduced to this freedom strategy. Kyle was also gracious enough to put together a definitions list of terms that we'll use often, and I'd highly recommend you have that open uh, for every podcast, at least until you get used to the terminology. I've also congregated all of the articles we've been able to find on Rayo and Vanu uh, in one place. Definitely some interesting reads there. So today, we'll be comparing and contrasting the direct action between various anarchic schools of thought with Vanu. Let's get started. We've already done this a little bit, but there's going to be some, some new stuff added in here. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we've got a list of, you know, uh, collectivist uh, direct action and individualist direct action. So, uh, and we'll start, uh, we want to end on a good note. So we're going to end with the individualist ones. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, collectivists, obviously, like your mutualism, syndicalism, syndicalism, which we've kind of already uh, hammered home pretty well, I would think. But there's a couple of new ones here that I think uh, we, should, we should probably address. Uh, and one of those uh, would be uh, affinity groups. So would you mind providing a uh, definition for that, Kyle, if you have one handy? Yeah, affinity groups are essentially like these amorphous uh, gatherings of, us, uh, of, of individuals who basically perform some sort of limited function. And again, the group is not, it's a little bit of a misnomer to even call it a gr uh, an affinity group because it's not really a group group. It's really just more of a gaggle of people. Um, the closest uh, modern version of this would be like a freedom cell, actually. Uh, but again, it's more amorphous. It's in a lot of ways, temporary, kind of, kind of like a temporary autonomous zone, right? But just, just for people to associate with each other for limited, uh, for, for limited objectives and so forth. So that's, that's basically it. Okay. Just you and a bunch of buddies doing something to, uh, for, for limited range uh, of goals. Okay. Um, so I, I think partially that, that could coincide with, with Vonu. I mean, we discussed like the close togetherness and obviously, I, I don't know actually, because if you're going to get, like get in one of these groups with people, uh, with with some individuals, uh, you're gonna want to be able to trust them. You know, you're gonna yeah. you're you're gonna have you're probably gonna be pretty close. Uh, so I don't know if this would. Um, I don't know. I I, I don't know. I, I would say I, I would lean more towards no, but I guess in some in some circumstances. I mean, uh, he mentioned uh, you know uh, like the the small community on on the water. Uh, so I, I don't know if that necessarily would be like an affinity group. He also mentioned, uh, uh, or this was actually Benjamin Best. He mentioned uh, that, like, uh, it was the question of whether Rayo would consider whether Rayo and uh, uh, what was her name, Roberto, would consider having children. And uh, he said, not with a group of two, but if if we had a group of four, uh, two couples. And I was like, okay, so I guess so maybe I guess maybe the idea of affinity groups could be applicable, but I I don't know. What do you think? Well, well, let me make this just concrete for people. Um, if you, if for anyone who ever watched that television series called The Walking Dead, you know, it's been referred to that the that the main. Uh, cast of characters that, that at least have survived thus far, referred to as the group with like a capital G. Um, that, I mean, that would be arguably an affinity group. I mean, it's not really a group group. They don't, they're, they're not like an official activist organization with like a name on it, right? Um, it's, it's more just a, a gaggle of folks who just have n kind of known each other. It's explaining a set of relationships is what an affinity group really is. And a freedom cell arguably works pretty, pretty much the same way, although I think the term freedom cell is a little bit more accurate. Um, hell, even in that one book report I did the other month on uh, James Wesley Rawls's, you know, Patriots, Novel of Survival and the Coming Collapse, I mean, that follows, they did the same thing there too with the group with a capital G. The those that cast the main characters weathering out some sort of socioeconomic collapse or whatever they called the crunch. 
and the group, well, technically those people, those, those, those uh, limited government folks, because they were really insistent upon the Constitution, as, as you can imagine, uh, they too were a freedom cell. So, yeah, it is kind of this groupy, uh, in some ways it can be, doesn't have to be, but can be a close togetherness type of thing. But it's like small numbers. I mean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Shane, but I think freedom cells are supposed to be what? Seven, like, eight, uh, se seven to ten. Like, it's, it's under ten people, for sure. <laughs> under right. ten people, for sure. Yeah. Right. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be a close togetherness commune type situation. But, you know, don't surprise if it, if it goes that way, you know, either. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, and I'm thinking about The Walking Dead. I haven't watched that in a while, but uh, but yeah, I guess that there were some members. Like there were obviously some, like a couple, few people in that group that were like really close, and the other ones they were just like, okay, like we're we're surviving. That's kind of our. That's like that they're here. We're we're, we're here to survive, uh, with, with without that close relationship. So I guess it is possible. And also keep in mind, sorry to interrupt, but also keep in mind too the amorphousness of the relationships. Because remember, because in that that fictional TV show, there were main characters that do occasionally die off. And so that kind of shifts dynamics depending on, on what their relationships were, whether stronger or, or weaker with the other people that they were uh, affinitated with, if you will. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, uh, so let's, let's go ahead and uh, move forward to, uh, well, I guess the, so, so the answer for affinity groups, is it compatible with Vanu? Uh, possibly. I, I would say probably it depends upon the, it depends upon, it depends upon the affinity group or the freedom cell. Uh, would you say that's accurate? If there, if they, I, I would say the, the, uh, I don't, I hate to talk about lines in the sand, but if there were a line in the sand on this one, Shane, I would say it's security culture. Like is the freedom cell in question practicing good security culture? And if it is, then, uh, you know, then that gets you closer to an invulnerability to coercion. And if it's not, uh, I would actually say it does the complete opposite. It would actually make you more vulnerable to coercion because remember the the police state informants and undercover agents and agent provocateurs and etc. like to get to uh, tr <laughs> raise trouble uh, and so uh, distrust between people who are uh, affiliated with each other, as it were. So mm -hmm. actually, it can go either way. And I think what makes the difference is security culture. Very good. Very good. So. Uh... This one, uh, I, I haven't heard this term before, uh, and I'm sure some of the listeners haven't either. Illegalism. Uh, would you mind uh, defining that? Yeah, illegalism is this old, um, really 19th century idea of basically committing crimes, even with victims, actual real crimes, uh, because that's what the state does. And so, well, you know, if there can be such a thing as public crime, then that, I guess that would mean, this would be the illegalist saying it, uh, that I guess that would mean private sector crime, you know, bank robberies even was what the illegalists were doing in France particularly. Uh, that, well, well then, uh, you know, that, that's acceptable now, burglaries and such, right? So they were very nihilistic. That's kind of the bottom line. So if the state can, be, can do all this tyranny, then us as just private individuals should be able to do the same things the state does, right? Hmm. In many ways, it reminds me of that one court case I wrote about uh, Justice Brandeis when he said that the government is the present omnipresent teacher, and um, you know it lead you know it teaches the citizens by its example. And what the illegalists do is that they take what Brandeis, at least in the spirit of what Brandeis said, quite literally, in terms of you know going and committing crimes, right? So if the, if, the, if the state, you know, for example, through the Federal Reserve System can commit counterfeiting, then why can't the illegalists also engage in counterfeiting in somebody's basement, right? That, that's kind of how they view it, right? Tit for tat and all of that. Uh, the problem with illegalism, as you can imagine, is that they are very blatantly and very pridefully and proudly, as they would say it, uh, violating property rights. Um, I mean, these would be the guys who would, for example, do the black block technique and uh, smash door windows. Uh, yeah, so when I interviewed Matt Pataglioli, we discussed the fact that, you know, most individuals live with, with two sets of morality. So uh, when they have interactions with individuals, I mean, uh, uh, most people would say that, you know, it's immoral to, you know, steal, rob, or kill them. Uh, but but when it comes to, when it comes to you know, the states, uh, the, the morality they kind of place on the states, uh, you know, the state can, you know, steal, uh, rob, and kill. Uh, and and that's that's apparently you know apparently moral. So that kind of ties in with uh, with illegalism here. Uh, as far as I mean, I guess the illegalists are you know like they're they're trying to find a solution to a problem and they're they're wrong. They're wrong as hell. Uh, 
uh, in in my opinion. But uh, uh, I guess they're they're kind of taking that to heart and saying, well, two sets of morality, or yeah, two sets of morality. No, screw it. We'll do we'll do the, the same evil things the state does. Yeah, and so in, and in other words, yeah, actually, to to get back to uh, some of Rayo's writings, there was that other essay. It's not in the Vanu book, but I think it's on the uh, the articles page on on VanuPodcast dot com. I believe it was called Libertarians and Coercivists. Mm -hmm. In that article, Rayo mentioned that. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, there, he made the distinction between felons or real criminals, like with victims and such, people who privately uh, coerce others, and then you have uh, statists. So he would have the, so he used the term coercivists to kind of describe basically everybody violating property rights, right? And then there's two types of coercivists. You have your felons or real criminals, and then you have your statists. Uh, which is what libertarians usually deal with most of the time, right? So you have your private crimes and your public crimes. And all the illegalists were saying is that, well, because of statism, therefore we get to be uh, felons or real criminals, if you will. And so that kind of moralistic nihilism is, is kind of where they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah, so so I guess, uh, is it compatible with Vanu? Uh, first off, I mean, Rayo did, uh, did discuss, I mean, uh, uh, voluntary interactions, voluntarism, he kind of explained the non-aggression principle and he talked about ethics and morality. Uh, so I would say uh, uh, no on, on, on that, like the moral and ethical uh, stance. Uh, but also, I mean, you consider like like these crimes, like bank robberies and stuff. I mean, that makes you more vulnerable to coercion. I mean, uh, if you get an armed standoff with the police, uh, you face going to uh, prison. I mean, that definitely makes you more vulnerable to coercion. Yeah, anybody watch Reservoir Dogs? Like that infant, that now cult film by Quentin Tarantino is all about, you know, a bunch of criminals basically doing a bank robbery that actually was a, or excuse me, not a bank robbery, it was a jewel heist. And it was a batched robbery too. So uh, the fact that it was so botched as much as it was, and oh, by the way, for people who uh, to, to, at the risk of spoiling the plot, there actually was an undercover cop as part of that, uh, that, that, that crew of, of jewel thieves and all that. And, and then that's in part why... It, it got botched was because he, of course, uh, let, the, let uh, that's the cops know that they would be on that. So you see there are themes even in fiction where a lot of this kind of police state stuff kind of comes in one more time. But, yeah, I mean, illegalism, I don't think it's consistent with anything, even even black flag or anarchism. <laughs> perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah. Like it, it, it's, it's basically it's ba you know what it really is. It's an excuse to. Uh, to basically uh, give some sort of moral cover for private criminality. That's what it is. Even if you don't believe in property rights, even the most anti-propertarian of anarchists still say you cannot harm another person's uh, body. They've always said that. Even the syndicalists say that. Uh, but the illegalists are saying, like, hey, even that's up for grabs. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, nihilism is a very dangerous thing when you start actually directly applying it, and the illegalists directly apply that moral nihilism to such an extent that, you know, they're, I mean, sorry, the enemy of my enemy is not always my friend. Sometimes they're just another enemy, and that's exactly what the Ill illegalists are. They're just, they're just private criminals. That's it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, so... Let's see, insurrectionary anarchism. So uh, I, I take it this would be, uh, I mean, you're at the attempted or even successful, you know, radical left uh, leftist overthrows of governments, like uh, maybe the Bolshevik Revolution. Would that be considered, you know, an example of this? Yeah, I'd say so. But also remember what happened to the Russian anarchists. They got betrayed by the Bolsheviks, uh, who of course, you know, became the Communist Party there in Russia and and elsewhere. So you know, it's. I think it would be fair to say that the insurrectionaries. Uh, or insurrectionists uh, would be revolutionaries. I think that is fair to say. But then again, not all revolutions are libertarian. In fact, most, True, yeah. most revolutions actually are very anti-libertarian. They're very authoritarian and so forth, right? Because by definition, a revolution is uh, generally speaking with very few exceptions. And I would like to mention one exception in a moment. Revolutions, generally speaking, are just violent overthrows not to abolish the state, but rather to just simply have a changing of the guard uh, through a use of force. Uh, so, in other words, ousting the ruler from his throne in order to put another through uh, put another ruler on that same throne. Right. Uh, a lot of the violent conflicts between the monarchy and the various aristocratic families in medieval Europe and England, in particular, were just were just like mini revolutions or sometimes full scale revolutions in in, in that sense. Right. Um, 
before on the random occasion when you would have a genuine people's war, I don't want to get too deeply in history, but I am drawing a distinction here. The whenever you would have a genuine people's war, or what I would like to think of as a real revolution, or or closer to one, uh, where people were basically seeking to overthrow a a despotic government, but then the problem was that those those people's wars or people's revolutions would usually get hijacked at some point to then not abolish the state, but in fact put in an, another ruler, sometimes some sort of sycophant who was from the peasant class instead of instead of the patrician or, or aristocratic. Uh, families and such. But if there was any real revolution that was to really make a difference, it would have to be the goal is abolishing the state. And so if the insurrectionary anarchists were actually genuine, their revolution would have to be what could arguably be the final revolution, which of course would be abolishing the state through uh, use of force, through violently overthrowing government, not to just replace one ruler or another, but rather to end government permanently in much the same way as one would put down a, a, a sick dog or even a, a violently uh, aggressive dog. And that would be, kind of be the attitude there if they were sincere. Um, but in terms of like whether insurrectionary anarchism is consistent with Vanu? Nope. Um, <laughs> no, not really, because remember, Vanu in many ways is about coexisting with the state, such as is today and for the foreseeable future, but like still maintaining uh, an invulnerability to coercion. So in a lot of ways, Vanu is much more defen uh, defensive and all that. Um, what other yeah, and, and, and plus uh, attempting to overthrow the government, uh, that's, uh, that, that exposes you to uh, uh, a lot of potential for coercion. So, uh, so that, and then Rayo also spoke of, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, rev revolutions, uh, typically, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time, actually maybe in 100%, uh, they lead to uh, the creation of new states. And, and, and if, if the people uh, are still living in that controlled schizophrenia, if they're still uh, uh, going to, if, if, the, if they're continue if they're raised in these government schools, uh, they're going to see a necessity for government. So even if, you know, uh, one government was taken down, I mean, uh, the belief is still in an in individual's mind. So uh, it's, it's not really going to do anything positive for, uh, for Venuans. No, no, it's not. And actually, uh, just two things, at least quickly in passing. One is the notion about the propaganda of the deed, which essentially is this idea of doing certain acts, sometimes violent, sometimes not, where you gain a lot of attention. And now you have media attention. The media is looking at you and you're raising awareness about an issue and all this like political rhetoric. Uh, about raising awareness or whatever, and it just and it's and, and then that like itself is supposed to be like an ends and a means simultaneously when in fact it is neither. You know, propaganda of the deed has been done time and time and time and time and time again. And last time I checked, statism is still around. Like people still believe in government, the legitimacy mm -hmm. of government, despite all these propaganda of the deeds uh, throughout the 19th century and and at other times. So the insurrectionary anarchists do. Engage, do use the propaganda of the deed, but it doesn't do much, at least I don't think so. And the other thing I want to mention, at least quickly in passing here, is that what's interesting about agorism is that it's still revolutionary in the sense of, like, you know, uh, you know, abolishing the state through first, you know, starving it and then smashing it. The insurrectionary anarchists are solely focused on smashing the state, usually without starving it at all, which is largely problematic, right? Yeah. So the agorists, what's interesting about agorism is that it's still revolutionary in terms of like fighting against this, the state and going on the offensive, at least in at least in that sense. But it's different from the insurrectionary anarchists because the agorists are about as close to insurrection being insurrectionary without actually being technically insurrectionary, right? Uh, if we're talking, for example, about like gunning down law enforcement or the cops, the bludgies, you know, the king's guards, as it were, uh, the blue coats, um, you know, the insurrectionary anarchists would be doing stuff like that uh, right out of the gate versus the agorists who would be trying to do other things like 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 avoiding the police or, or, or thereabouts and only if there's something like a raid or whatever, then would the agorists try to, you know, match force with force or, or something to that effect. But the insurrectionary anarchists, I don't know, man, they seem to be m like borderline uh, martyrs, if you will, or wannabe martyrs. Mm -hmm. They basically want to go and fall on their swords all day. So is it consistent with Vanu? I don't see it. It's not defensive at all. And, and in fact, and it, it, and unlike agorism, it doesn't even address how would you finance 
such a revolutionary effort. The insurrectionary yeah, wars, wars, don't know the answer to that. War, wars and revolution, wars and revolutions are expensive. You got to get guns. You got to get. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you're going to use explosives or anything, you got you got to have you got to have some money to, to actually like fund that. So yeah, that's don't a that's forget, a good point. You know, don't forget your underground railroads, your safe houses, your alternate identification for both operatives and VIPs. You're supposed to be protecting. I mean, revolutions are very very expensive. And remember. You know, if this was a genuine, like, people's war type thing to abolish the state, you know, we got to do this shit on the cheap. And quite frankly, that's not happening, right? I mean, we, I mean, normal people can't rely on central banking in order to fund their, to fund or, their wars. Right? Or, or taxation. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, it's got to be private, privately funded. Yeah. Right. And so, unless the insurrectionary anarchists were doing something like an assassination market, which actually is arguably cost effective, unless they're doing something like that, this stuff isn't going to be done cheaply at all. And it can't be. And it's not like they have these long trains of, a uh, long, uh, like trains of like logistical uh, supply lines like the state does with its militaries that are backing them with like, you know, food and tents and like all that kind of stuff. You need to actually make a war happen. Um, so they don't have any of this stuff. So is it consistent with the Vanu? No, no. It's not about invulnerability. It's not about being invulnerable to coercion as possible. It, they just don't do that. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so we we have a couple more, but they're very closely related to what we've uh, already discussed. So I'm just going to jump forward to the individualist uh, portion uh, of of this section. Uh, and the first one on there is uh, free love. And uh, uh, is it compatible with Vanu? I mean, uh, uh, Rayo had a uh, a free mate. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely uh, compatible with Vanu. Uh, one hundred percent. So there's no reason it wouldn't be. You know what? Uh, the right of association and disassociation. Uh, disassociation and uh yeah you know choosing a, a lover a, a free mate whatever you want to call it i mean that's definitely compatible with vanu yeah i mean the original conception of free love was was it's true that it was happening right about the same time there was kind of the vague hippie notion of it but suffice it to say free love was originally a, a libertarian effort to basically rebut the assumptions that uh, marriage had to be essentially uh, monopoli be monopolized by the state through a license. So it's not even the marriage part of it that's necessarily the problem, because remember, marriages are a type of contract that pre-existed the state. And a lot of it was to, uh, was actually about property transferals without getting too historically specific. But it was about, you know, so about maintaining, you know, the, the stability of property and so forth and, and transferring title ownership and all that, whether it's lands or, or cattle, if we're going really far back and so forth. Uh, marriages preexisted the state. The main issue was about licensure and other things related to that, like uh, you can't perform certain sex acts. You can't do this. Basically, the criminalization of, at worst, what would be vices like prostitution, for example. So... Yeah, free love was definitely a, a way to push back against all that and say, like, look, I mean, much like we can voluntarily associate with each other, well, one form of voluntary association is, quite frankly, romance. And to kind of ignore that or, or otherwise make these assumptions that, oh, well, of course we must get the marriage license and get permission from bureaucrats to basically do those types of things with our lovers that we were doing already beforehand you see the problem. Mm -hmm. And because romance, um, or, or even just, well, I want to keep this PG-13, but, but even sexuality, uh, does deal with issues of hearth and home. And that is very much, uh, and protecting that, making that as invulnerable to coercion as possible, you know, the stability of all, and remember, sex created the family too. So making sure that issues related to hearth and home uh, is very much a concern and, and, and a goal and a focus of Vanu, very much so. Definitely. So, yeah, when Rayo talked about uh, his free mate, he talked about, I think he talked about Dr. G, right? Uh, yeah, and, yeah and the, in the book, and then the, the name came out by Benjamin Best, Roberta. Yep. Right, yeah, his free mate. So, yeah, the, the notion about, you know, free love of and all that. Now, I know some people can get into the weeds and some people can do this, and maybe perhaps we should address this later, uh, but like monogamy versus polyamory, right? And, you know, at that point, as far as best as I can tell, that's all that's all personal choice type of stuff. Right. You know, just because hypothetically, just because I drink whiskey doesn't therefore mean you must drive a pickup truck. Right. This mm -hmm. is that's not issues of, of ethics and morality of right and wrong and so forth. That's just individual market preferences. 
and regarding something like monogamy and, and polyamory, that, that, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, that's just individual market preferences too, isn't it? Whether you have mm -hmm. one lover or, or two lovers plus, right? Uh, the issue is, is not really about that. The issue is should the state dictate to people whom uh, they're going to love, whether, whether it's a chaste romance type situation or if indeed sexuality is involved at least to a, one extent or another, right? That's the issue, and that's what the original free love advocates were about, not about breaking up the family like many of these disgusting conservatives like to insist upon that free love broke up the family. Uh-uh, we were trying to preserve the family, numb nuts, not go to a bunch of bureaucrats and legitimize the state through marriage licenses. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. I think we. I think that pretty much covers that. What do you think? Yep. Okay. This next one, uh, di do-it-yourself ethic. Um. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> uh. Recommend all of you open up uh, uh that uh, copy of the PDF of of of, of Rayo's book and just look at some of those diagrams in there, uh, especially re regarding the uh, polyurethane tent. Uh. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I think the di DIY ethic. I mean, he was figuring these things out as. As he was doing them, he was he was he found out some things failed, some things worked. Uh, he improved upon his uh, his uh, creations, his innovations, and uh, yeah, it was completely do it yourself. And Helvani, like as as this cohesive strategy, uh, it was pretty much all do it yourself by by Rayo. So this one is certainly compatible uh, with Vani. With without it, Vani wouldn't even be a thing. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. And honestly, like I'm having a tough time finding any sort of quote unquote experts or gurus or self-appointed guardians of the status quo of various flavors. Um, basically anywhere, uh, re re anything involving Vanu or even other related libertarian strategies like agorism or just other things. I mean, generally speaking, I mean, even, even libertarianism itself is basically one big DIY ethic type thing, right? It's, it's you know, you, or actually I should say more precisely, direct action actually, that, uh, like that Freeman Brill of Direct Action that you and I have put out. Mm -hmm. uh, like that is, that is like pretty much, I, I'm having a tough time seeing how it could be otherwise, but I think it's either 100% or pretty close to maybe like 90 some odd percent like DIY ethic type stuff, right? Where Definitely. you take upon your, your own personal responsibility to secure your own liberty and property rights and so forth through any of these, you know, methods we list in our directory and so forth. And yeah, Vanu is basically... Uh, very much part of that direct action where uh, you're not relying upon experts and just other people saying, well, we are authority and we have shown in our grand scientific pseudo studies funded by government, which is, they don't say that last part, funded by government that you should eat two eggs a day. And then of course they change their mind. Then you shouldn't eat eggs. And then five years later, they say you should eat eggs again, but then, oh, but then it's the egg whites, but then it's the yolk. And they keep flip-flopping all the damn time because, well, it's the winds of political expediency, ladies and gentlemen, they can't be consistent with anything. And so it's better to just, you know, be as rational as you can, follow your own conscience and really take that DIY ethic uh, pretty seriously. Indeed, indeed. Uh, moving forward here, uh, jurisdictional arbitrage, which I think would be something similar to like, you know, country shopping. Is that uh, correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. Basically using, uh, the, the legal interstices or the law or the laws as they are today, not changing them with political crusading, but as they are today to basically make yourself as invulnerable to coercion as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, uh, that's definitely, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely Vanu. I mean, uh, a lot, I mean, uh, some folks, I mean, especially uh, uh, some of Rayo's suggestions or, you know, possibilities of making your money in one country and then living in another, uh, that would uh, definitely be, you know, making yourself more invulnerable to coercion. Uh, you know, living on the water or, you know, uh, um, having multiple, multiple places of residence or just, you know, outright moving from, uh, I don't know what, a, a really terrible, uh, a really tyrannical government to one that's you know uh, won't won't uh, uh, won't be as infringing. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's definitely Vanu, even if it's just like a a, a small decrease uh, in the uh, possibility of coercion. Yeah, that that's pretty much kind of the long and short of it. I think I think when we do get around to actually doing that podcast, getting into more detail about country shopping, we can definitely uh, explore more about jurisdictional arbitrage. I think Rayo had some things to say about it too, in terms of like leveraging, you know, being a resident versus being a tourist and getting into more nuts and bolts on that. But just here in transitory passing, yeah, it is, 
it is a very individualist way of dealing things, right? It's like, what are the legal interstices for you if you're in, say, the Bahamas versus, let's say, hypothetically, uh, Brazil, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the laws in different nation states are differently, and if you're smart and you can figure out what the laws are, you can use it to your own advantage to make yourself, again, as invulnerable to coercion as possible. Indeed, indeed. So uh, you mentioned that you mentioned uh, temporary autonomous zones uh, when we were reading. Uh, there was a definition for, I don't remember what it was off, off, off the, oh, it was Second Realm. Uh, Second Realm was, was the definition uh, that they were reading. But uh, yeah, temporary autonomous zones and permanent uh, autonomous zones. Let's go ahead and define those terms uh, real quick and then we'll, uh, you know, discuss whether they're uh, Vani or not. Right. So the idea here is that I guess you could basically say that when people gather together to engage in certain activities, they need to be able to do so in a way that doesn't have a lot of risk of being interfered with by the state or even put under even surveillance even, uh, the surveillance police state apparatus in particular, right? So the temporary autonomous zones are essentially mobile ones. So much like the affinity groups and freedom cells would be very amorphous, in, in their and how their relationships work, the the TAS are very similar in that it's it's very mobile, right? So uh, just because a bunch of people, for example, uh, got together and uh, performed some sort of activity of one kind or another uh, in a certain location, does not therefore mean that particular geographic location should always be used for that particular activity that they like engaging in. If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it may need to be done like five miles away next week or maybe uh, 200 miles away, you know, in, in a couple days or whatever, right? I mean, regardless of those specific details, the main idea behind a TAS is that uh, due to mobility, which I think Rayo mentioned uh, earlier on in, in the Vanu book. Yeah, yeah, cru yeah crucial, to him, crucial to him. Uh, mobility was crucial. Is that's, that's kind of the main idea with TAS. So, like, for example, if we get together tonight with, like, 50 people and we have a rave, uh, and let's just say uh, some people prefer to be more psychedelic than others, and I'll just leave it at that, then fine. Uh, but as long as, you know, the event was put on and there was a minimum, and presumably it was kept within good security culture was practiced, and there was a minimum amount of, of uh, outsider people who were not invited to the party. Uh, and, and it's also the, the specific location, right? Obviously, you don't want to do it in a suburban area, right? Because, you know, some old fuddy-duddy might call the cops, right? And make you vulnerable to coercion, right? That, that's kind of the problem there. But if you were to say do it in an industrial park or or some sort of abandoned garage or some other location where you know you could you could pretty much pull it off, as long as your your communications were good and you didn't you know invite anybody you shouldn't have, and of course preferably you would also have some people not necessarily engaging in the certain activities that evening, but perhaps were themselves uh, performing the function of bouncers or or otherwise on-site security personnel to make sure. That everything was pretty okay then then you're good and then of course when you do your next rave party or whatever don't do it at the same spot you did it before right because the state relies upon stuff like that so yeah. for example a good example of what's not a taz would be something like a nightclub right because a nightclub has to be at a specific location right and they have to be licensed by the state and so forth with the business licenses and such and liquor licenses right Yep, so, yep, yep, yep. So the idea is that these these um, these zones, these these tasks specifically, have to be mobile. And then, yeah, even if they put on a one-time event, it wouldn't always be in the same place because again, the mobility is important as well as uh, secure communications and and some degree of vetting and you know bouncers even. So I mean, if you do it right and you know market cooperation works, you can put on you know and do all sorts of things that you would never get away with <laughs> in a nightclub. Which uh, is obviously uh, something I'm not going to repeat here because I want to keep this family friendly as much as possible. <laughs> but suffice it to say, I mean, you can get away with a lot if if there is good security involved. Be a very prof profitable venture as well. But uh, interesting example there. But yeah, you're you're yeah you're you're right. Uh, you're definitely well, right. Lunch pits even in in some circumstances, right? But uh, but yeah, the the idea is that it's whether it's an event or it's some other specific function or whatever, as long as it's mobile, it's, well, as the T in TAS says, it's temporary, you, you can do quite a bit. And so, by comparison, the, the, that PAS, or permanent autonomous zone, is just 
a, a more stable version of it. But again, that's getting into more what Rayo called like free ports and stuff more along those lines, which of course introduce other factors and are, I personally think are a lot harder to pull off. And I think Rayo even recognized that. Well, yeah, that was, that was, that was kind of why he, you know, uh, went off in his, uh, uh, in his uh, camper uh, on on his pickup truck uh, was initially because of those uh, failed Free Isles projects. It really never came to fruition. He said, screw it, I'm not waiting around. I'm going to take my, my life and my freedom into my own hands. And that's uh, that was kind of the, the, the result was Vanu. Uh, now, do they have potential uh, nowadays? We'll definitely get into that in uh, more podcasts, and you're, you're, you're going to want to continue listening uh, every, every single week. Uh, but uh, I guess one other temporary, I guess, I guess it could be temporary or permanent, really, right? Uh, when it comes to, like, you know, the, the Vanu shelters. So I think you call them uh, Vanus, uh or, or home base. I think you call them that, too. But uh, I guess those would probably be uh, more... T more. T well, actually, yeah, they'd definitely be temporary because uh, he, he wrote in that book uh, that, you know, they had they, they changed locations every, uh, you know, whatever the, whatever the frequency was. But they uh, you don't want to bring so much stuff into your home base that it'll be uh, really hard or take a long time to, you know, relocate. Uh, so I think uh, volumes, you know, the, the home bases, the home shelters, uh, really uh, the, the place where you're most secure, I think those really would have to be temporary, don't you think? Well, at least in the way that Rayo is experimenting with, yeah. I mean, what he was essentially describing was the establishment and, and of course, the use of uh, the, the TAZs, the temporary autonomous zones, like that polypropylene tent, wall tent type thing with the branches, and, the, and he mentioned like one time the snow fell on it or something. <laughs> um, you know, that was a TAZ. Uh, the foam hut thing that he was experimenting with too, that, that was, that was a, a, a TAZ, and so was the, I think, what was it, the den, I think he called it. You know, that was a TAZ too, and, he, and so those types of shelters, or Vanu shelters, of the ones he experimented with were, 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 were Taz's. I mean, even before when he was a van, uh, well, he called it van nomadism, but now the modern term is van dweller. And there's all sorts of people up on YouTube who, if you type in van dweller, you can see people videos of people who say, yes, I'm living in my van full time. I mean, those guys, I mean, that those are all temporary autonomous zones too, with wherever they end up parking the van for that evening. I mean, that that's a Taz too, technically, because they're mobile. So, you know, that, that's kind of another version of it. The question, though, and this is, and in some sense, this is debatable and perhaps better for when, when we do the episode on van nomadism, is does actually having a TAS make you less or more vulnerable to coercion? Because there's also been some evidence coming out, at least in the sense of the van specifically, that you might be making yourself more vulnerable to coercion. But again, we'll, 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 we'll kind of table that for now for that later episode. But it's definitely something to consider. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess for for the uh, for the TAZs and PAZs, the temporary and permanent autonomous zones, uh, for right now, I I, I I guess we'll kind of just leave it as uh, there's a lot more to get into. So, uh, are they are they Vanu? I mean, they uh, they probably could be Vanu, but there are a lot of factors that have to be taken into consideration. And uh, for the purposes of this podcast, it's not really applicable. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, and wrap this up, Kyle. What are your closing thoughts? My closing thoughts are that I think that the I think that anarchism and the anarchist schools of thought, by and large, can be uh, vanued at least in some way, right? I think I think those those folks who really do care about freedom and, and liberty, at least in some sense, uh, really ought to consider pursuing an invulnerability to coercion rather than either engage in endless uh, bickering and sometimes debate, but really just more bickering about nuance and minutia, like what the limited government people do, and instead get very practical about what it would actually mean to live freely, uh, you know, in, uh, <laughs> in, in early 21st century North America. I mean, what would that actually look like? And I think that if they were to take invulnerability seriously, they would start to realize a couple things. One would be, they, again, that DIY ethic being an important element of it, that they need to take personal responsibility for their own security. Remember, the state likes to trick people, and the neoconservatives in particular, they like to trick people into saying that, well, we must have national security, and it's time for you to give up your liberty in order to have security, right? And the truth of the matter is that, in fact, in order to have any real security, you need your liberty. It's just like survival. If you want to have good survivability, you need to be free. You need your liberty. 
And security works exactly the same way. In reality, to have good security, you need to be free. You need liberty, period. It is, it is a, I personally think it's a one-to-one -one correlation. So if you want good survivability, you want good security, you need your liberty. You need to not be constrained by the government's use of lawfare, the government's use of democide and other methods of tyranny that basically threaten to basically uh, put the population under more subjugation than they, than, than they already are. So uh, is, you know, is, is Vanu anarchic? Uh, not necessarily, I, I guess maybe in one sense, but then again, what does the word mean? I mean, without rulers, right? And so if we're pursuing invulnerability to coercion, to be perfectly frank with you, Shane, I don't see a ruler anywhere Yeah. Uh, as I'm pursuing invulnerability. So I guess maybe more by happenstance or accident, I guess it would be more arguably closer to being anarchic or what John Locke in Second Trade of Government called a state of nature. I would say that's accurate. That yeah, mm -hmm. if you're if you're pursuing you are even if you're doing Vanu in the cities, and you have some sort of Vanu shelter like um, uh, like an uh, anonymous apartment uh, under rented under a pseudonym, or you're living. Uh, Rayo pointed this out too. Like even some areas uh, of, of certain like enclaves of people in certain like inner city areas that interestingly enough actually have some degree of invulnerability. Although there's also a lot of private crime too. To be perfectly frank. Um, that, that, but, but again, those people have to be take security very seriously, right? Because the state, the police, the blue coats are not going to defend those innocent uh, residents there against gang bangers and private criminals. They actually have to have guns, for example, to defend themselves from drive-by shootings and other similar types of things, right? So uh, there, there is, that's something to kind of consider is that uh, <laughs> life could be a little bit more complicated in some ways. But I honestly do think, man, that I think... Vanuists and, and, and Vanuans are closer to being anarchic rather than not because there are no rulers that are going to make us invulnerable to coercion. And statists, unfortunately, do think, and some of the minarchists, unfortunately, to some degree, think that having rulers uh, makes them invulnerable. Yeah. And yeah. that, I think, is a very serious delusion uh, to, to take into consideration here. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think comparing, contrasting, you know, Vani with these various uh, anarchic schools of thought really, really does show you. I mean, uh, uh, there are obviously there are a couple. I think syndicalism and uh, anarcho transhumanism really have no place, that really just aren't applicable to Vani. Uh, really at all. Uh, but for 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 uh, for these other ones like uh, mutualism and uh, uh, voluntarism, uh, I th I think it really takes it it, it it takes the good from those into this again co like this cohesive. Uh, uh, like adaptable strategy to your lifestyle. So yeah, I really think this this uh, podcast uh, should really show you the potential that uh, that that Vanu has. Uh, but we haven't even really gotten to the action yet. So uh, if, if going through these these initial episodes and and you're and you're thinking, man, this this is sounding pretty good, sounding pretty good. Well, uh, uh, yeah, you're in, you're in for a ride. <laughs> but uh, anything else, Kyle? Before I close out the show. Yeah, I would just say this again. Um... I wouldn't really kind of going going forward into the future from this point onward, although at times it might be useful for people to compare and contrast the limited government position with the no government position. And I still do think it is the great debate of our time because it largely kind of incentivizes people uh, to pursue certain means rather than others. I would just say this, like Vanu itself is an ends and means and an insight. And I think part of that insight that Rayo was trying to uh, teach people was that whether we have you know, rulers, a few rulers, or limited rulers, which kind of doesn't make any sense, or 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 no rulers. Uh, the point is let's let's be invulnerable to coercion, right? Because the private criminal element we will have with us always, simply because people have free will, and for whatever their reasons are. Uh, they will choose to violate property rights. And so even if we were living in Ancapistan, we would still need to have an invulnerability to coercion from private criminals and real felons and so forth. So I think, uh, I think Vanu is very practical for libertarians in that sense. And that is uh, that is a good point uh, as well. If uh, Incapsin comes around tomorrow, you'll still need Vanu. Uh, very good, very good. Uh, well, thanks, Kyle, so much uh, for your time. I appreciate it. Yep, same here. Okay, so uh, thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. 
We certainly hope you enjoyed it and found it valuable. And again, we're getting closer and closer to the action, but we've got to lay this groundwork first uh, before, uh, before, we, before we actually get into that. Next week, we'll cover a term Rayo used called legal interstices, or, or otherwise known as uh, legal loopholes within the law that can be exploited. We'll discuss the benefits, potential ramifications, which Rayo went very deeply into, and much, much more. Make sure you'll check out the website, vonnypodcast.com. And again, if uh, this is the first time you're hearing this term, uh, Vonny was spelled V as in victory, O, and as in Nancy U, vonnypodcast.com. Uh, go take a look at the definitions page, the frequently asked questions, and the articles about Vonny tabs there at the top if you're looking for some homework to do uh, to keep you occupied until next week's release. Lastly, please consider leaving us a positive review on iTunes to help us get a good boost early on. We would certainly appreciate it. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. Podcast dot com.